So you want to use Bootstrap, but your website is going to look like every other website out on the interwebs. Let's mash on that. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the ASP.NET Monsters. In today's episode, James is going to show us how to make Bootstrap not look exactly like Bootstrap. Yeah, so there's a few things that we want to do, and we've talked about a couple of these in a couple of other episodes. I'm going to link to those. Namely, those are manipulating tasks uh, using gulpfile.js and, of course, reintegrating your um, the tool chain uh, using Bower and whatnot. And we're going to pull in some dependencies, and then we're going to modify one of our um, one of our uh, uh, tasks that we've got in our gulp file and then we're going to look at what it takes to actually modify some of the uh, templates themselves. So we're not going to dive too deep into the SAS side of things which is the um, the uh, edit or the uh, uh, I guess the templating language or the CSS preprocessor language that's uh, available and SCSS which is referred to as SASE CSS is kind of that next iteration and it, it is a 100% CSS compliant um, or compatible uh, extension uh, or uh, development advancement of SAS and what they've done is they said okay well with SCSS all CSS documents are automatically valid SCSS documents. So it's kind of like the whole JavaScript and TypeScript thing, except this is for CSS and SAS. So we still get all gotcha. of the benefits of looping in all of the things like variables and mixins and, and whatnot that SAS has to offer, but every CSS file is now also compliant. So it reintroduces things like the semicolons and the curly braces, things like that, and it gives us a, a closer to CSS experience. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is because uh, prior to Bootstrap, the later version of uh, Bootstrap 3 and, and uh, uh, from there and forward, including Bootstrap 4, which is what I'm going to show right now, um, Bootstrap is now using SCSS as the default language. So we want to use uh, SCSS as well if we're going to be working with the sources for Bootstrap. And so we're just going to have a quick look here at how things break down. So I, I pull in the Bootstrap package, and this is going to uh, throw Bootstrap into my Bower components directory in the solution. And inside this directory, we get a folder called SCSS. And as you would guess, all of the partials are in here, um, as we did, ha as we saw before with SAS, but now they're all in SCSS. So this is the actual source code for Bootstrap 4, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. So when we look inside of, I'll pick one um, that's interesting, and actually I'll, I'll point it out for a reason as well. But here's, um, uh, where did buttons go? There's buttons. So I, I wanted to point this one out because if I just head down to the end here in buttons, um, there's 177 lines of code inside this SCSS, but because of the preprocessor and everything that happens as this gets extrapolated out and you see the um, things like these nested, there's a little bit of inheritance going on and whatnot, these actually get expanded out and there's over 600 lines of code that end up in your final CSS. So one of the things that you want to make sure you're doing is if you're not going to use part of Bootstrap, don't include it inside what you're actually going to output for your own custom version of Bootstrap. Okay, so a couple of things you probably want to look at if you, if you want to extend your own. You're going to find in here all of these, and how we compose the final version of Bootstrap is we, we basically end up with a source file that includes all of the partials that we want to include. There's a couple of prerequisites. We need to make sure that we maintain those. So for example, none of the coloring pieces will work if you don't include the variables. None of the sizing things will work if you don't have those for the grid. So in order to have those pieces work, we need to make sure we have a couple of prerequisites in, but then we can kind of chop up the parts that we don't need and it's not going to output any extra CSS. So we can have a thinner download um, as, we, as we move through that. So. Uh, I'm just gonna okay, have a so look the motivation at... for this is that it'll be less to download and less for the browser to try and process. Um, that's right, and then th th so that's for the reduction in size, absolutely. But more importantly, if you're not going to be able to leverage like a global CDN version of Bootstrap because you're not going to take on the exact same thing as everybody else, then you might as well make that smaller. You know, in, in that same vein, you might as well make that smaller. Um, and even though it's only going to download once, I mean, you can get into a you know a lot of conversations about how 
worth it it is. But the biggest point is, is that we're going to treat our CSS as source code, right? So we want to be able to build something that uh, is going to be the same from environment to environment. And we want to be able to to take advantage of any updates that come to the Bootstrap library. There's, you know, I when I dove into Bootstrap pretty deeply in version three, there, it, there were so many incremental upgrades through that. And earlier on, I wasn't taking this approach. And so what I ran into as roadblocks were, were really that, you know, I couldn't, if there were fixes in the CSS that made it more compliant from browser to browser and render correctly and more pixel perfect from browser to browser, I couldn't take advantage of those things because I had just gone in and customized the CSS. So rather than taking that approach, I can leave all of the partials intact for the entire bootstrap framework, but then I just customize the pieces I need, which are you know the sizings, the colors, those kinds of things, and build my own custom version of the bootstrap CSS file. Okay. Sorry, I, I got distracted there. We use the incorrect past tense of dive. Oh. But that's a very Canadian approach to things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> did, did, so I, I don't think I have to repeat anything. You can just you can watch it later online, Simon. So I'm not gonna. <laughs> Okay, Thanks. so uh, so where are we at here? So okay, so now inside of this, as I said, are all the partials. So we would want to compose the entire SCSS document that we were going to create, and that would allow us to output just by including those partials in and including the variables in. Uh, the partials are omitted from the preprocessor. So if we can point. Uh, a preprocessor at a directory and those partials are going to be emitted but we also want to just leave what's in there leave the bootstrap SCS and S in this directory we don't want to manipulate this one because it's going to get overwritten anyways so what what one of the things that you can do instead is to just basically make a copy of that file and so I did that and I put that down into um, a folder called style and in here we can see the SCSS. Now I did have to do, so I, I just basically copied and pasted that in here and I had to change all of these import statements. So if you look at the bootstrap CSS, it's just, it says import custom, right? And so originally it looked like that over here as well. And I'll just show you a really quick shortcut in order to get past this. But um, when I had that in there and you know what, I'll just take the whole thing and I'll show you what I do. Cause it's a cool, little quick find and replace idea here. So I don't know the exact structure that it wants, but Visual Studio understands how the structure is. So I can go and figure out the, the full path, or I can just drill in to the SCSS. And I can see that the first one here is custom. So I'll just go and grab custom in here, throw it in there, and then it gives me that path automatically. So what I can do then is essentially copy everything right to there, and then I'll just delete this line and replace this guy. Let's say control H, replace, and I won't do the entire solution, I'll do in the current document, and take this import statement and replace it with this import statement. And if I do replace all, then it replaces all instances of it. So just an easy way to get your path straight um, if you wanted to. Uh, do it that way. Okay. So once that's in place, I now have my own custom version of this bootstrap CSS and I just, you know, name it with my project name or whatever the case may be. And then I can, from here, I can go on and, and chop things out. So if I'm not going to be using the bootstrap, um, what are some things I might cut, uh, cut out here? Um, like maybe I'm not using cards and bread comes and bread comes pagination. Paginate, pagination, pagination, right? That's how we say that. I think so. Won't be using jumbo. We should check with Simon. Yeah. I would say pagination. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm sure you would. I'm sure you would. <laughs> so um, I can, and then I can take these the, these pieces out that I don't need, right? As as I go. So, okay. Um, and then the components that require JavaScript. Maybe I'm not using popple, uh, popple, uh, modal or tooltip or pop over carousel, et cetera, et cetera. So I can remove those ones as well, and that'll help me reduce the footprint. But one of the really interesting things that I could do is I could actually create my own variables. Um, partial and include that instead and I could do that just inside my own directory and then that that makes things a little bit more interesting so I will go and grab this variables SCSS and I'm going to paste that down into my style folder and I'm just going to rename that guy oh uh, actually I'll do my project name is what I meant to do and now inside my 
custom version here, I can go in and start to change things like the color scheme that I want to, and then I can include that into my, my files. Well. So that's how I'm going to do, you know, in here I've got colors, there is the spacing um, to help kind of like how things are laid out and uh, your padding between elements and all of those kinds of things are controlled through this variable. So there, there's just a, a, just a ton of, of things in here that you can do. So I'm, I'm scrolling through it very quickly, but you can see in here, if you wanted to customize the text shadow of the carousel, then you could do that here inside of, of this uh, document. Um, SCSS also supports just overriding. So if you want to just uh, pare this down to the, the elements that you're actually interested in changing. Maybe it's just the colors, maybe it's just the spacing of something or the default margins that you've got for an element. Then you could take everything else out, include the default variables first, and then include your own version of the variables where you override those settings. And that'll make it a little bit easier to maintain. So that's probably a decent strategy to follow as well. That way you're not scrolling through, you know, 850 lines of SESS trying to figure out where was that one thing that I changed that's different from the original. Um, okay, so we get the variables in place, and um, at that point, all that's left to do is to update the gulp file. Now, in this one, there was already a CSS uh, preprocessor in here, so I'm just going to go ahead and use that same one. So here's the SAS, the gulp SAS library being imported. So, of course, we need to make sure that we've got that included in our project as well as one of the dependencies. And then we set up the, there's a, a SAS path, and in this case, I actually, in the glob, I just added a wildcard because there was already a SAS file in this particular site. And what it allowed me to do is to basically include anything that's at SASS or SCSS. And the SAS preprocessor actually supports both formats. So if it's got the SAS file or the SCSS file, we can actually make use of both. Um, you're going to say something, Simon? Nope. No? Okay, good. Well, that's good um, to me. Not good that you're not saying anything. You can say anything you want to. I'm not. Don't. I'm not. I'm not one to judge um, as far as that goes. Unless you say it with uh, an incorrect accent, and then we'll correct you. Okay. Um, so beyond that, we have the um, SAS task, which basically takes any of those inputs that were in the paths array and then outputs them to the destination. So this just again it takes those. Uh, anything that we've defined in our globbing um, statement, and then it'll run that through the SAS preprocessor and output it at the destination that we've previously specified. That happens to be configured here. Um, the SAS destination is webroot plus CSS. And if you want to work backwards, then webroot is defined as www.root plus CSS, and then we can scroll up here, I'll minimize the power components, we've got www.root, we've got CSS, and then you can see this CSS file gets put in there. Now, one of the interesting things is that we've got this concat CSS step as well that's defined in here, and that takes the any of the CSS files that are in our webroot slash CSS, and it puts them all into a minified file. That means that anything that's in our site.css, along with everything that was in the bootstrap.css, will move into the site.min.css. So our entire um, CSS is now here on one line of, of code. So it's just an immensely long string, and that's the minification that happens. So we've actually talked about all of these um, other types of things, the, the minification, the bundling. We've talked about modifying the gulp file. But I just wanted to cover a little bit maybe more about a strategy for customizing Bootstrap just so that we can encourage people to not have the exact same looking website as everybody else out on the web. And there you have it. Awesome. That looks great. That's a lot better than my usual approach, which is uh, just editing the Bootstrap file and then having terrible problems when Bootstrap releases new versions. Uh, apparently right. by doing that, I'm not really a web developer so <laughs> hey listen that sad. was dave's that was dave's words not mine <laughs> that's not what i said i just said you were doing it wrong i thought that you were a web developer so the, right. doing a compiling sas this used to be actually pretty hard for developers on a windows machine right because it it involved installing ruby and right. a, a bunch of other things um so Doing this this way because it's using Gulp. I guess it's all Node based, and Node is something that works really well on Windows, easy to set up, and isn't, isn't there that's a quite a bit easier now, right? 
I thought there was like a native lib sass library written in some compiled language that made everything faster. There, there's actually a. I think the gulp, like the node package for the uh, SAS compiler, precompiler, is actually a native. Um, it's an, it's got a native library right. behind it, and so it is super quick. And there's some command line tooling, and maybe in a future episode we can have a look at some of that. Cool. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for joining us again here on the ASP.NET Monsters. Remember to like, comment, share, and send us an email with your comments or questions. And everybody who does, if we read your question and comments uh, on the show and we do something with that, we're going to send you one of these laptop boosting stickers. Um, <laughs> that just, I mean, you don't even, like if you were considering in the last 18 months buying a new laptop, don't bother. Just ask three questions. Need? You know. Yeah, so, that'll add. One of them will add video memory, another one will add like, RAM, and the final one will, one will add CPU power. So. Um, this, the um, the video the video import, improvement sticker hasn't come out yet, but that is going to, hopefully in the new year, I'll be ready. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs> Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Cheers.